felicita. Buenas tardes a todos. Quiero asegurarme que este es el momento de eh, comenzar la nueva sesión, ¿correcto? Um, antes que nada quisiera eh, felicitar a, al grupo de enfermedades raras de la OMS. Es espectacular lo que han puesto o, ustedes y en particular estoy muy um, orgullosa de que me hayan elegido para presentar a dos um, eh, eh, speakers hoy um, y para tratar el tema de hipofosfatasia. Um, como ustedes saben, el, primer, eh, el que va a presentar primero es el doctor José Luis Millán, o José Luis Millán, como diría yo, va a hablar sobre el eh, forfatasia alcalina e hipo y hipofosfatasia. Um, el doctor Millán es nativo de Mar del Plata y recibió su formación inicial en bioquímica en la Universidad de Buenos Aires um, y después de allí emigró a los Estados Unidos donde se, se unió a, el, a la Joya Cancer Research Foundation, que ahora es el Sanford uh, Barham Presbyterian Institute, en, en 1977. Hizo allí una pasantía en eh, enzimología clínica. Completó después su doctorado, su PhD, en la Universidad de Umea en Suecia y después de eh, a, hacer eh, periodos de postdoctorales en Copenhague, regresó al uh, Sanford Barham Presbyterian uh, Institute en los Estados Unidos, donde fue nombrado miembro de la facultad en el año 1986 y eh, posteriormente investigador en el programa de genética humana en el Centro de Investigación de Salud Infantil Sanford en, en el año 2008. La investigación preclínica del doctor Millán se enfoca en entender los mecanismos que controlan la minimización esquelética y uh, uh, la um, formación también de, de los huesos de los dientes y dilucidar las anomalías fisiopatológicas que conducen a huesos blandos hereditarios en condiciones como por ejemplo la hipofofatasia, que es el tema de lo cual nos va a hablar hoy, así como también la calificación de tejidos blandos, incluida la calificación vascular. Um, esto es, por supuesto, lo que les tengo que contar del doctor Millán con respecto a su trayectoria profesional. Eh, yo tuve el placer de conocer, conocer a José Luis um, um, no hace tanto tiempo, hace algo así como 10 años o un poquito más. Eh, nos encontramos en un congreso en eh, Foz de Iguazú, en Brasil, y allí fue donde lo conocí. Y me, me llamó muchísimo la atención porque eh, después, por supuesto, he seguido su trabajo a partir de ahí. Y me he dado cuenta que lo que ha hecho José Luis es lo que aspiramos la mayoría de nosotros los bioquímicos. Eh, empezar a, a trabajar con alguna molécula chiquitita como el fosfato alcalina desde el punto de vista enzimalógico, es, eh, conociéndola como enzima, los sustratos y todo eso eh, en detalle que hacemos los bioquímicos. Pero después él tuvo... Eh, eh, Creo yo que, que la fortuna, pero la fortuna no viene sola, sino también el talento, de concentrarse en entender los mecanismos por medio de los la, 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 cuales la, la, la fosfatasa alcalina controla los te, la mineralización de los tejidos y entonces llegar a esta, um, esto que está, lo que está trabajando ahora, que es hipofosfatasia. Y, eh, estoy, creo que lo que ha hecho la OM es poner eh, no solamente... A, a, enfatizar lo que ha hecho José Luis y va a ser importante, sino también ponerlo junto con la parte clínica con el doctor Mac, igual que hablar después. Estos, estos dos investigadores tan talentosos se juntaron, me decía José Luis, en el primer paper que publicó José Luis, eh, en el año 1980, donde ya empezó, se empezó a ver la conexión entre fosfatasa alcalina y hipofosfatasia. Así que no voy a hablar más y lo voy a presentar a José Luis. Muchas gracias a todos. Hola, buenas tardes. Soy José Luis Millán. Es un placer estar nuevamente con ustedes, aunque sea de esta forma virtual. Quisiera agradecer a la doctora Brance y a todo el comité organizador de esta conferencia de enfermedades poco frecuentes por la oportunidad de presentar eh, nuestros trabajos. Y dado que estoy en la misma sesión con el doctor Michael White, voy a dar la charla en inglés, así que les pido disculpas por eso. So today I will introduce alkaline phosphatase and focus mainly on the physiological substrates based on our studies uh, on the mouse model of hypophosphatasia, introduce the disease as well, and then Michael White will take over and discuss the clinical features of the disease as well as the treatment. So what is hypophosphatasia? Hypophosphatasia is the inborn error of metabolism featuring rickets or osteomalacia caused by loss of function mutations within the tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase gene. The prevalence varies uh, between one in 100,000 in the United States, one in 300,000 in Europe, and it can be as high as one in 2,500 in Canadian uh, Mennonites. 
The affected gene is the ALPL gene, which is one of four genes in humans. The other three are tissue-specific, placental, germ cell, and intestinal. Um, and similar number of active genes in mice, although the mouse uh, model also has uh, an AP pseudogene that is not, that is not expressed. Uh, the genes in human, the, the tissue non-specific genes in humans are clustered on chromosome two, uh, TNAP gene or ALPL gene is on chromosome one, and in mice, uh, ALPL gene is in chromosome four, and the other genes and pseudogene are on chromosome, chromosome one. The ALPL gene is quite large. Uh, it's composed of 12 uh, exons, uh, spanning about 50 uh, kilobases. And disease-causing mutations are essentially spread throughout the gene in all the exons. There appear, appears to be no hotspots of, uh, of mutations. Um, here is a list from the Etienne Morgnet database, which, by the way, has now been taken over by Dr. Hoegler. Uh, in, in Austria, and this is a new uh, URL. It's a very useful database, has a lot of information about the, the type of mutations, uh, uh, mutation analysis, and so forth. It's worth uh, checking. Uh, most mutations causing HPP are missense mutations, 71% of them, and with, with minor frequencies for uh, splice mutations, non cell mutations, small deletions, and so forth. What about the enzyme? Here is an image of the crystallographic structure of placental alkaline phosphate. It's the only alkaline phosphate that has been crystallized. So based on the placental model, we, we model the TNAP structure. It's a very symmetrical structure, as you can see, with two active sites per, per homodimer. It's an obligatory dimer. The enzyme will not function as a monomer. Obligatory um, dimer. Here is another view of the, of the homodimer in a different representation. So you can see some of the features. See, for example, uh, the large extent of the monomer-monomer interaction. Uh, about half of the residues of the enzyme are involved in monomer-monomer interaction. Uh, the position of the N-terminal end of one subunit, which really embraces the other subunit. And this explains, in part, allosteric properties of the enzyme. The crown domain, which is a surface loop of the enzyme that has the properties of binding to collagen could be uh, involved in, 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 in function. And then where the GPI anchor, the glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol anchor is located, and this is what tethers the enzyme to the cytoplasmic membrane and to the membrane of matrix vesicles. So to place TNAP in the context of bone biology, let's focus on the growth plate where uh, hypertrophic chondrocytes bleb these uh, bags of enzymes called matrix vesicles, which is where uh, initiation of mineralization takes place. Matrix vesicles were co-discovered by Clark Anderson and Hermano Bonucci in the early 60s. These are uh, Im images taken by René Boucher in France uh, of um, electron microscopy of, of um, matrix vesicles. And you see this dense material in the lumen of the matrix vesicles, which in indicate the initiation of mineralization. Uh, here are images taken uh, in our laboratory by, by um, uh, Massimo Bottini uh, using atomic force microscope, where you see this beautiful, huge crystal growing uh, within the confines of these matrix vesicles. So initiation of mineralization takes place within these matrix vesicles. This is where calcium and phosphate come together to form the seed crystals. And here we need to introduce the important role of inorganic pyrophosphate in suppressing the initiation of mineralization, as well as the propagation when crystals grow and essentially perforate the membrane of the matrix vesicles and become exposed to the extracellular matrix. Uh, in, in the second step of mineralization, as, as Clark Anderson would define them. And then finally, the mineral is propagated onto the collagen scaffold. So pyrophosphate has a very crucial role in controlling the rate of, of this process. Crucial importance of uh, extracellular concentrations of pyrophosphate. If you have too much pyrophosphate, too much inhibitor, that leads to hypomineralization, rickets, osteomalacia, hypophosphatasia and also chondrocalcinosis, the position of calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate. 
If you have too little systemic pyrophosphate, then you have hypermineralization disorders in the form of osteoarthritis, ankylosis, and even arterial calcification, and some rare diseases where there is just too low levels of uh, systemic pyrophosphate to suppress this uh, unwanted calcification. Uh, as Isabel Oris would call it, pyrophosphate is really the water softener of the body. It prevents unwanted calcification while allowing calcification to proceed in the, in the tissues where it's meant to because you have alkaline phosphates that hydrolyzes pyrophosphate. And indeed, here it is uh, very well exemplified. Uh, work again with Clark Anderson early on, looking at the mouse model of HPP that we have developed, where you see that it is propagation of uh, mineralization outside the matrix vesicles that is affected uh, in, in hypophosphatasia mice, not initiation within the matrix vesicles, where you see here mineral within the matrix vesicles. And this was puzzling to us, and that led us into almost uh, 25 years of work to try to understand um, what alternative uh, pathways that would be involved in the initiation of calcification. So here is a depiction of the pathways involved in initiation of uh, mineralization um, mediated by matrix vesicles. Within the lumen of matrix vesicles, phosphor one generates phosphate using phosphocholine as substrate. This phosphocholine is derived in turn from sphingomyelin by the action of SMPD3. So this is one pathway of concentrating phosphate within matrix vesicles. The other pathway is incorporation of phosphate, perivesicular phosphate, by the action of phosphate transporters, P1. This phosphate is generated by the action of alkaline phosphates, TNAP, from ATP primarily, but also from pyrophosphate. Uh, that is why we like to talk about uh, the role of pyrophosphate to the phosphate ratio in the extracellular milieu and not just pyrophosphate, because alkaline phosphate has this dual role, generating phosphate as well as hydrolyzing pyrophosphate. Pyrophosphate is generated uh, by the action of NTP1, um, which also can act as a backup phosphatase, uh, particularly in the absence of alkaline phosphatase. So it's, it's a backup phosphatase. Uh, osteopontin is a very potent inhibitor of mineralization, 200-fold more potent on a molar basis than pyrophosphate, uh, which binds to mineral as soon as the mineral punctures through the matrix vesicles, and potentially is involved in also suppressing extracellular mineralization. Uh, and it happens to be also a substrate of alkaline phosphate. So alkaline phosphate is dephosphorylated phosphorylated osteopontin, which is an inhibitor, turns it into dephosphorylated osteopontin, which is not um, uh, so inhibitory. So outside the extracellular matrix, it is really all alkaline phosphate. It's the most potent pyrophosphatase uh, in the body. And its primary role is to restrict the concentration of pyrophosphate essentially conditioning the pyrophosphate to phosphate ratio to allow mineralization to proceed normally. So here we have defined three physiological substrates for alkaline phosphates, inorganic pyrophosphate, ATP, and phosphoosteopontin. So here is an image uh, of the hypophosphatasia mice. Um, they are born normally, but they begin to develop skeletal disease at six days uh, postnatally, and they die before weaning. They are a model of uh, infantile hypophosphatasia, one of the most severe forms of the disease. And Michael White will refer to the less severe forms uh, during his clinical talk. The HPP can be inherited in a recessive fashion as well as in a dominant fashion. Now, compound heterozygosity of mutant alleles is the most... Uh, um, common form of presentation with variable expressivity. And a lot of the variability is due not only to the fact that there are more than 400 mutations identified uh, for HPP, but also the role that these enzymes can play as modulators of the phenotype. Since they're all involved in the same pathway, phospho one EMPP1, OPN can potentially modify the HPP phenotype. So here is a brief summary of some of the studies we've done on this mouse model. Clearly, they, they, they lack a secondary ossification centers, uh, and this is caused by the increase in, in pyrophosphate, uh, soft bones, very abnormal uh, uh, 
uh, bones, in a particular in the axial skeleton, uh, evidence of craniosynostosis. We don't quite understand the mechanism of craniosynostosis, but uh, some sutures are abnormal in this animal model as well. And in collaborations with uh, the Dr. McKee, Foster, and Sommerman, we have looked at the tooth organ, which is very sensitive to a lack of alkaline phosphatase. So the denting is abnormal, the acellular cementum is abnormal, the enamel is abnormal. Uh, particularly the acellular cementum is very important here because this is what uh, leads to the periodontal ligament not being properly attached and children with HPP can essentially pull their teeth right out of the, of the socket with the root intact. One of the features of this model of infantile HPP, as well as for patients with uh, the most severe forms of the disease, are the seizures. And in this mice, uh, the seizures lead to their demise. They die shortly after these uh, severe episodes of seizures. And the seizures are caused by abnormal metabolism of pyridoxal 5-phosphate, vitamin B6, the active form of vitamin B6, which is needed for the synthesis of neurotransmitters, GABA, serotonin, dopamine. What happens is that in the, in, in the central nervous system, alkaline phosphatase is needed in order to dephosphorylate pyridoxal phosphate traveling through, through the circulatory system, dephosphorylated to pyridoxal, a hydrophobic form of the vitamin that can traverse membranes. And then inside the cell, it is rephosphorylated by pyridoxal kinase, and then it can be used for uh, the synthesis of GABA, serotonin, and dopamine. And this uh, pathway is defective, so these animals are defective in pyridoxal 5-phosphate inside, inside the CNS. Abnormal uh, metabolism of pyridoxal 5-phosphate also leads to features uh, in the spinal cord. Here we have thinning of nerve roots in the lumbar spine that we identified early on. Then together with Caroline Fonta, uh, we, did, we were able to define reduced white matter in the spinal cord, reduced ratio and diameter of myelinated axons, and also the absence of myelinated axons in the cerebral cortex. So quite uh, profound morphological um, features uh, in the CNS uh, of these animals. And again, confirming that pyridoxal 5-phosphate is a physiological substrate of alkaline phosphates and, and plays quite an important role uh, in, in this uh, CNS-derived uh, uh, symptoms. Now, we talked about ATP in the context of generating phosphate by alkaline phosphates. In the process of doing so, um, alkaline phosphates is also able to produce adenosine. So from ATP, um, hydrolyzed uh, or dephosphorylate to ADP, to AMP, and to adenosine. And why this is important is because both ATP and adenosine can act on cell function and, and, and phenotype through the action of uh, purinergic receptors, P2 receptors, adenosine receptors. Uh, so in HPP, uh, there is an imbalance uh, in the ATP-adenosine ratio. ATP accumulates, adenosine is reduced. And this has also uh, physiological consequences. Indeed, um, eight, uh, T, uh, alkaline phosphate is TNAP is one of three enzymes responsible for adenosine formation at the level of uh, dorsal spinal cord and acting on um, pain receptors, on non receptive receptors. So um, in HPP, this deficiency could potentially explain some of the, of the pain uh, experienced by, this, uh, by these patients. This is something that uh, we need to look further into, into the mechanisms of pain in HPP. The role of TNAP in the formation of adenosine was also explored by Offer Levy in Boston, uh, where he was looking at neonate plasma and uh, neonate plasma has much higher levels of alkaline phosphatase than, uh, than adults. And this is reflected in the formation of adenosine, much higher adenosine in the plasma of newborns compared to adults. And adenosine is an anti-inflammatory molecule. So the implications could be that in HPP, there is, um, there is a more pro-inflammatory situation than, than, in, norm, than in, in normal unaffected neonates. This needs to be looked at more carefully. One of the important purinergic receptors to examine is the P2X7 receptor, 
which uh, is activated by very high levels of ATP, just the situation um, that you would expect in the HPP uh, model. Um, Miguel Diaz Hernandez in Madrid looked at the P2X7 receptor knockout animals that do not experience seizure. This is one of the main targets uh, currently in the pharmaceutical industry for anti-epileptic drugs. So indeed, by, by using the agonist ATP, you could, not in, you could not induce seizures in the P2X7 receptor knockout animals. You can in wild type animals, and even more so in mice heterozygous for an alkaline phosphatase null mutation. He couldn't use the HPP knockout mice because they die perinatally, so he used the heterozygous mice. And indeed, the frequency of seizures is higher in the heterozygous and in wild type. So then he decided to superimpose the P2X7 receptor mutation to the alkaline phosphatase mutation, generate the double knockout animals. And these animals live a little bit longer. The important thing is that they die, but they die without seizures. They die of respiratory compromise, inability to breathe, but not of seizures, as opposed to the HPP knockout animals um, that we had studied before, that they all die with seizures. So clearly, P2X7 receptor has a function to play. Furthermore, he looked at pyridoxal 5-phosphate, and he found that PLP is an inhibitor of P2X7 receptor. So the fact that HPP mice have a deficiency in PLP um, synthesis within the cells because of inability to incorporate PLP leads to the P2X7 receptor to be derepressed. And a derepressed receptor is going to fire and cause seizures. And he identified P2X7 receptor uh, firing as one of the major causes of seizures. So in HPP mice, in addition to the deficiency in GABA, serotonin, and glutamate synthesis, there is also uh, increased firing of the P2X7 receptor due to two things, accumulation of ATP, which increased uh, firing of the receptor, and also reduction in PLP levels in the CNS, which act as uh, normally act as, as, uh, as a repressor of firing. And now with reduced levels, P2X7 receptor is, uh, is hyperactive. Furthermore, Miguel Diaz also demonstrated that alkaline phosphatase, uh, once again via P2X7 receptor, is important for axon growth. And lack of alkaline phosphatase leads to accumulation of ATP, increased firing of P2X7, and shortening of axonic length. So again, morphological changes in the HPP mice because of uh, the deficiency in, uh, in, in this P2X7 purinergic signaling. So here I would like to introduce another substrate of uh, alkaline phosphatase, which is bacterial lipopolysaccharide, which was proposed as a substrate of intestinal isozyme many years ago by Klaas Poelstra. Um, the lipid A moiety of LPS has two phosphorylation sites, and the molecule is toxic uh, when, when it has two phosphate groups. If you remove one, the molecule is, uh, is non-toxic, it's inactivated. Now, uh, class recently has identified that um, the important role of uh, TNAP in the liver in protecting from liver fibrosis. He studied uh, fibrosis in both mouse uh, and, and humans and associated fibrosis formation um, based on uh, LPS challenge and upregulation of TNAP which essentially is a protective mechanism to try to dephosphorylate and inactivate this endotoxin, protecting the liver from, from further damage. Along the same lines, Offer Levy once again looked at neonates, this case with a, with a history of late onset sepsis, and uh, he demonstrated that TNAP is able to dephosphorylate bacterial LPS from two different species, and this uh, LPS activates the toll-like receptor 4, um, to exert its, its toxic effects. Uh, and neonates with late onset sepsis, rather than declining in the levels of plasma TNAP as they normally would, remain high, again, as a, as a mechanism of detoxification um, uh, in vivo. And then Candice Brown recently showed the important role of TNAP in, in sepsis. She demonstrated that in the brain, in somatosensory neurons, uh, alkaline phosphatase is decreased during episodes of sepsis. Here you see the quantification um, of alkaline phosphatase activity. And that 
is accompanied by uh, a change in uh, blood brain barrier integrity, a decrease in blood brain barrier uh, integrity um, during sepsis because of a decrease in TNAP. Once again, associating um, TNAP with LPS action. Now, this recent paper in collaboration with the Spiegelman lab shows quite unexpected results. Uh, and that is normally we would have considered TNAP to be an extracellular uh, enzyme present on the, on the surface of the plasma membrane as well as MVs. And this is true in most of the cells in the body. However, in brown fat, it appears that TNAP can be localized to the mitochondria. And brown fat are cells that are involved in thermogenesis. And uh, Bruce Pigelman demonstrated that uh, indeed localization of TNAP to the, to the mitochondria in brown fat cells. And also that TNAP is involved in this futile uh, creatine cycle that generates heat. Uh, now, this is a cold inducible cycle that allows us to regulate body temperature. By inducing TNAP, it essentially helps, works together with creatine kinase uh, isozyme B to generate heat. The absence of TNAP would lead to inappropriate mechanism of thermal control. And uh, I wonder whether this could explain the decreased tolerance to cold temperatures that hypophosphatasia patients uh, describe as having. And now I will finish with the substrates by uh, briefly referring to phosphoethanolamine, which clearly is um, a good marker of the disease, but I have never been too convinced that it is a natural substrate of the enzyme. And if it is, I do not know what metabolic uh, pathway is involved. Uh, together with permagnoson in Sweden, we looked at the kinetics uh, using Par, um, phosphoethanolamine as substrate as well as pyrophosphate and pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And as you see from this table, uh, PEA is a very poor, very poor substrate of the enzyme, uh, looking at the bone isoforms that uh, PEAR is able to isolate uh, using HPLC analysis. So very poor substrate, uh, in vitro at least. Now, this brings me also to the first paper I ever published, which was with Michael White. Um, on a large kindred of adult uh, uh, hypophosphatation, the adult form. And in that paper, we showed um, uh, an inverse correlation between the levels of uh, urinary phosphoethanolamine and the liver isozyme of alkaline phosphatase, the liver isoform, rather, uh, of alkaline phosphatase, um, indicating that perhaps the liver isoform is involved in the generation of... Uh, of PEA or in the metabolism of PEA. So my current feeling is that phosphoethanolamine is not itself a substrate, but rather it is elevated as a consequence of reduced levels of pyridoxal phosphate in the liver to be able to help in the catalysis of, of uh, phosphoethanolamine by uh, phosphorylethanolamine uh, lyase. That's the pathway that I would like to explore further to try to understand uh, why PEA is elevated in the urine of HPP patients, which it is, undoubtedly. So I've talked a little bit about the substrates of TNAP. Clearly, we know that pyrophosphate is involved in hypermineralization, crucial, crucial substrate uh, to explain the pathophysiology of the skeletal and dental disease. Uh, I talked a bit about pyridoxal 5-phosphate, explaining seizures, explaining myelination defects, phosphorylating osteopontin, explaining hypermineralization as well. ATP, another physiological substrate, explaining hypermineralization, seizures, potentially pain mechanisms, axon growth, AMP involved in inflammation, LPS involved in sepsis, fibrosis, uh, phosphocreatine involved with thermogenesis, and a little bit about phosphoethanolamine, which undoubtedly a useful marker, but in my view, uh, cannot yet be considered substrate, and at least I do not have a clear path, a clear indication of what pathway is involved. So back to um, hypophosphatasia, and how to treat this, uh, this condition. The question is, how could we introduce the missing enzyme to the sites of mineralization where it is needed in order to cleave the accumulated levels of pyrophosphate, allowing classification to proceed? Well, the answer came from a meeting we had in 2005 with scientists from Inovia Pharma 
in Montreal, Canada. Enovia's proprietary principle was to add a polyaspartic acid motif to the C-terminal end of the alkaline phosphate is to confer binding ability to hydroxyapatite. They also introduced an FC region of immunoglobulin to allow rapid purification uh, and also uh, increase the half-life in plasma of this uh, recombinant molecule. And as you can see here, the bone targeted or mineral targeted TNAP bound to hydroxyapatite 32 times better than the unmodified enzyme. And experiments shown here in my laboratory uh, while the alkaline phosphatase knockout mice are completely deficient in alkaline phosphatase, once we injected this recombinant enzyme, the bones light up with alkaline phosphatase activity. So a very, a very elegant principle and a very effective principle. Now, implicit in this principle is, of course, that the, that the recombinant enzyme is going to bind to site of calcification wherever that may take place. And uh, uh, this is a recent paper from our laboratory showing that um, the recombinant enzyme, asphotase alpha, binds not only to bone and teeth, but also to sites of ectopic calcification. We use two very severe models of vascular calcification to show that the enzyme can bind to calcifications in the heart and in the aorta. So this is important for clinicians to keep in mind as they monitor patients on lifelong treatment uh, with asphotase alpha. But this is uh, essentially my last slide that will bridge my talk with that of Michael White that shows this uh, remarkable journey, starting in 2005 with a meeting with Enovia Pharma, the preclinical demonstration of efficacy of mineral target alkaline phosphatase in my laboratory, a presentation of this data at the meeting in Unang, France, where the, actually the, the clinical trials were initiated. This is where Enovia recruited the first patients for clinical trials that were directed by Michael White. Uh, signs of efficacy in, in, uh, in the clinical setting, this remarkable efficacy. This child shows the, the pretreatment and just 24 weeks after treatment, remarkable improvement of the skeletal mineralization. And finally, this drug was approved in 2015 for pediatric onset HPP, a remarkable journey um, and this is really a life-saving treatment for, for patients with HPP. And uh, with that, uh, I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions um, uh, now or after Dr. White's talk. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, José Luis uh, Milán. Um, espectacular la, la, la presentación. Voy a directamente ahora introducir eh, al doctor Michael White. Las preguntas, por favor, guárdenlas para el final de la presentación um, para los dos um, um, speakers. Um, el doctor Mark White va a hablar de hipofofatesia, clínica, la experiencia clínica y el tratamiento. Eh, el doctor White fue introducido um, en la sesión anterior uh, por Paula Rey, pero voy a repetir lo, 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 los datos más importantes. Eh, eh, Michael White obtuvo su título de doctor en medicina en uh, Down State College of Medicine en Brooklyn, New York. Um, e hizo una pasantía y un entrenamiento um, como residente en medicina interna en el Bellevue Hospital, también en Nueva York. Y después de dos años como médico clínico eh, en el DNIH, en Bethesda, Maryland, completó una beca de investigación en la División de Enfermedades Socias y se unió a la Facultad uh, de Medicina de Washington University en San Luis um, y también a, al grupo personal médico del Hospital Shriners para niños, también en San Luis, Missouri. Eh, los intereses de investigación del, doc del doctor White incluyen la causa, resultado y tratamiento de los trastornos hereditarios como óseo y mineral en niños y en adultos. Uh, se, incluyen, se incluyen estos... Uh, um, estas enfermedades, eh, formas genéticas, raquitismo, como hipofofatasia e hipofofatemia ligada al cromosoma X, osteogénesis imperfecta, afecciones que causan uh, huesos densos, um, nos habló de eso en una um, uh, conferencia hoy, como la osteopetriosis y trastornos del recambio esquelético acelerado, incluida la enfermedad de Paget uh, juvenil, uh, 
Um, las investigaciones de laboratorio incluyen la caracterización de nuevos trastornos y la, la, la búsqueda de nuevos genes, mutaciones en genes. Las correcciones fenotipo, genotipo, um, apuntan a comprender mejor la patogénesis de las condiciones establecidas, y eso es lo que enfoca en la investigación del Dr. White. Uh, la terapia de reemplazo de fosfatasa alcalina dirigida al hueso y también el tratamiento con anticuerpos neuronales anti-FDF-23 um, han sido evaluados y aprobados por la FDA en Estados Unidos para pacientes pediátricos con hipofosfatasia, que nos va a hablar hoy en esta conferencia, y también con hipofosfatemia ligada al cromosoma X, en el caso de FDF-23. El Centro de Investigación de los Hospitales Reiners para Niños en San Luis, um, uh, allí fue donde eh, sirvió como recurso nacional para el diagnóstico y tratamiento e investigación de trastornos del metabolismo óseo y mineral de displasias esqueléticas en los niños. Eh, el doctor White es autor o coautor de más de 400 artículos y capítulos científicos relacionados y, y eh, a mí me parece espectacular lo que hace en, en darnos estas conferencias para continuar nuestra educación y update us en todo lo nuevo que, eh, que aparece en estos tratamientos. Um, muchas gracias. It's a pleasure to introduce you, Mike White, um, and now um, um, the audience is going to listen to you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, you've just heard a wonderful lecture by Professor Mian concerning the biochemistry of alkaline phosphatase and uh, mineralization. I've been asked in the next 20 minutes to turn to the disorder hypophosphatasia and talk about its clinical uh, manifestations and how we could go about treating it. The story really begins just after World War II when this gentleman, John Campbell Rathbun, was doing something new at the time, and that was a fellowship in pediatrics at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada. Uh, he was referred a, a young boy, about three weeks of age, who clearly had rickets and tried uh, to give vitamin D supplementation Uh, minerals, but uh, there was no change in the x-rays, and the little boy had seizures, went on to die from pneumonia. There were paradoxes about this experience because the little boy had elevated levels of blood calcium and phosphate, not low levels, and most remarkably, his serum alkaline phosphatase activity was low, not elevated, Uh, Dr. Rathbun uh, performed an autopsy on the little boy and found that there was no detectable alkaline phosphatase activity in the boy's liver or bones or kidneys. So in 1948, he published uh, this article, Hypophosphatasia, uh, suggesting that it was a new developmental anomaly. And some years later, when he saw additional cases, realized that it was an inherited disorder. Uh, Dr. Mian has told you that in us human beings, there are four genes that encode alkaline phosphatases. Three uh, are tissue specific, we would say, encoding a placental, intestinal, and germ cell form of alkaline phosphatase. But the fourth one is ubiquitous, and it's especially in bone and liver, and therefore we call it tissue non-specific alkaline phosphatase or TNS-ALP. Hypophosphatasia is a heritable metabolic bone disease and therefore it's characterized uh, or is characterized by defective skeletal mineralization. And in an infant or child, this would mean uh, that rickets is a sequelae And if its a, a onset is during adult life, it would render an osteomalacia. Its biochemical hallmark is low serum alkaline phosphatase activity, not hypophosphatemia, but hypophosphatasemia, low alkaline phosphatase. And even in the, if I could say, pre-DNA era, we knew from alkaline phosphatase protein purification that hypophosphatasia is an inborn error of metabolism where there's a global deficiency of TNS-ALP activity. But if you looked in the intestine or placenta, there are alkaline phosphatases, the tissue specific ones are normal. 
So an inborn error of TNS-ALP. In hypophosphatasia, as Rathbun knew, circulating calcium, uh, phosphorus, and even vitamin D levels are not low. And in severe cases like his, there's hypercalcemia and even hyperphosphatemia with suppressed PTH levels. So it's as though something is blocking mineral calcium and phosphorus from going into the skeleton. Uh, I think that hypophosphatasia can be said to have the greatest range of severity of all skeletal diseases. And I'll show you this. We know how broad ranging osteogenesis imperfecta is, but you'll see that hypophosphatasia is even more so. And I would tell you that it's the last type of rickets or osteomalacia to have a medical, some sort of medical treatment, and I'll go over this with you. It's um, uh, now known that loss of function mutations in the gene ALPL that's encoding tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase is the cause of all true uh, uh, patients or all true instances of hypophosphatasia with now more than 450 different uh, defects in the ALP gene identified worldwide. And of interest, about 72% of these are missense mutations. So scattered throughout the um, alkaline phosphatase gene, um, uh, impacting adversely on the homodimer, uh, that is the catalytically active form of TNS-ALP. So we have to handle the broad ranging severity and there's a nosology for hypophosphatasia according to the age when the patient is diagnosed. And this approximates severity in this way. At the very top, if there's severe disease at birth, we call it perinatal hypophosphatasia and that's the most severe but a little bit more mild is infantile, more mild than that is childhood. Then there's adult hypophosphatasia presenting usually in middle age. And I'll show you odonto hypophosphatasia where there's no evidence of skeletal disease, but there is dental abnormalities. And it's uh, certain now that the severe forms are inherited as an autosomal recessive but the mild forms can be autosomal dominant from a dominant negative mutation in the ALPL gene. But quite remarkably, there are mild cases where the inheritance is autosomal recessive. Two minor defects, we'll say, in the gene encoding ALPL come together and the expression is only mild severity. But here's the worst, here's perinatal hypophosphatasia, not enough bone to keep the skin here from becoming wrinkled. That's a plastic clip. There's almost no evidence of skeletal mineralization here. And you can understand how there could be stillbirth, deformed limbs, uh, apnea, bradycardia, respiratory compromise. And interestingly, and I'll come back to this, B6 dependent seizures, don't be startled because I'm gonna show it um, in a second. This is obvious at birth, perinatal hypophosphatasia. And that's what one of the B6 dependent seizures looks like. If you treat with B6, you can control it for a short period of time. Then there's infantile hypophosphatasia. This little girl looks sort of okay, a little hypotonic on a pillow at one month of age. But then over here on the right, uh, bulging anterior fontanelle proptosis, rachitic rosary, and overt rickets. So infantile hypophosphatasia can have wide fontanelles, hypotonia, perhaps related to hypercalcemia, complicated by nephrocalcinosis. The skull might not grow, and there's a functional craniosynostosis, failure to thrive, pneumonia. And the infants, too, could have vitamin B6-dependent seizures. And this is not diagnosed or uh, classified at birth, but occurring, presenting before age six months. About 50% of these uh, infantile cases would die within the first year. 
and it was estimated uh, that about 50% would improve over time, but often with sequelae of rickets. That would look like this. Here's a survivor of the infantile form, plenty of debility, plenty of uh, difficulty with muscles and bone and pain. Then there's the childhood form. These brothers are now in their 40s. You can see a little uh, knock knee deformity of the little one on the right. But characteristically, they lost teeth with the tooth and root at tooth with its root intact. This was without trauma. This was out bl without blood or pain. And it's often the in lower incisors first and the upper incisors, but more teeth can be lost. So here you have premature loss of deciduous teeth. No child should lose a tooth before age five. Sometimes, but not usually short stature, rachidic deformity. There can be true bony craniosynostosis, muscle weakness, delayed walking, and a waddling gait. And this is diagnosed after six months of age before, let's say, the adult life. So that's the childhood form. And as we tested uh, enzyme replacement therapy that I'll talk about, um, we decided there should be classified as severe childhood form. So here's an example. You'll see her later. Uh, difficulty with walking, but not life-threatening. That's severe childhood. And then this little girl had some uh, changes on X-ray of rachidic uh, bones, but uh, mild childhood hypophosphatasia, quite functional. Then there's adult hypophosphatasia. Uh, presents usually in middle age. There could be loss of adult teeth, a little difficult to know whether or not that's different from the general population. Osteopenia. But then if you had to say how they're going to present, we would say metatarsal stress fractures that heal, then heal slowly, recur, um, uh, and don't heal at all. Femoral pseudo fractures, a radiographic hallmark of an osteomalacia, and then rheumatologic disease, which could be pseudogout from pyrophosphate accumulation, same with chondrocalcinosis, and then paradoxically, calcific periarthritis, where there's hydroxyapatite crystal deposition around joints, typically presenting during middle age. And here's three ladies, uh, tall, straight legs, edentulous, but they started having trouble with these uh, metatarsal fractures, had osteomalacia and bone biopsy. And then for decades, the, this proximal lateral femoral break that looked like a prodromal lesion for an atypical femoral fracture, let's say from bisphosphonate or anti-resorptive therapy, uh, persisted. So a pseudo fracture resembling an AFF being characteristic of adult hypophosphatasia. And then most mild there's odonto, childhood or adult, no radiologic skeletal abnormalities, but just premature loss of teeth. And this little guy had no skeletal disease, but he lost his lower incisors, upper incisors, and could do this. You ask him to run, he could do that. You ask him to hop like a frog, he could do that. So he's a healthy boy uh, with odonto hypophosphatasia. And then most mild of all, this healthy little girl, she loses this tooth with its root intact before her fifth birthday, but then the teeth that are lost subsequently have their roots restored by osteoclasts. So we would say to you, she's a one tooth odonto hypophosphatasia, most mild. And in general, as you go from odonto to the infantile hypophosphatasia, here's the alkaline phosphatase normal range. These patients always have low levels. The more severe, the lower. But look at the overlap of the data. So if you get a measurement here, uh, let's say here, you can't tell if it's odonto or infantile. There's not a great precise correlation, although there is some between how much serum alkaline phosphatase activity and disease severity. How do you diagnose it? It's remarkable how often hypophosphatasemia is overlooked or ignored. As clinicians, we know why we're looking at elevated alkaline phosphatase, skeletal or hepatobiliary disease, 
but um, low levels are often ignored. And it's important to realize that kids, adolescents especially, have higher levels of serum alkaline phosphatase compared to adults, so that if you had a child with hypophosphatasia whose alkaline phosphatase is actually low, but your laboratory is only reporting adult reference ranges, they might say, that little kid's got a normal alkaline phosphatase. So the laboratories have to give you pediatric and adult uh, normal ranges to diagnose correctly. There are actually many causes of hypophosphatasemia beyond hypophosphatasia. They're usually severe disorders, profound anemia, hypothyroidism, uh, zinc, magnesium deficiency, um, these sort of uh, entities, and you'll have this to help you interpret, uh, to know what to look for if you encounter low alkaline phosphatase activity. The radiographs are very interesting in hypophosphatasia. There are some very characteristic abnormalities. In fact, I almost think of uh, the rachitic change as pathognomonic. If you really um, can uh, distinguish, know the difference between hypophosphatasia and other forms of rickets. There's metaphyseal fraying, but also sclerosis. There's tongues of radiolucency, what looks like physeal widening, uh, illustrated here. And we'll come back to this when we talk about treatment. And I must say that um, ALPL mutation analysis is now available uh, widely in the United States. But one out of every 300 Americans is carrying a mutation. Uh, carriers are uh, prevalent. Uh, it might explain why one per 100,000 in the United States has severe hypophosphatasia. But knowing that carriers are prevalent, I would say a positive carrying one mutation in the ALPL doesn't tell you uh, your patient has hypophosphatasia. If positive, it certainly supports the diagnosis, but it's up to the doctor to know whether or not that patient is manifesting complications like I showed you to really deserve the diagnosis of clinical hypophosphatasia. So what's the pathogenesis? Well, there's phosphoethanolamine. You can measure this in urine uh, or blood. That accumulates in hypophosphatasia. So does pyridoxal phosphate, PLP. This is the principal circulating vitamin form of vitamin B6. And inorganic phosphate, pyrophosphate, is up in the blood and urine of these patients. These are the natural substrates for alkaline phosphatase, tissue nonspecific and they accumulate endogenously. When we found that B6 was elevated, here's the normal range for PLP. And as you go from adult to perinatal hypophosphatasia on this log scale, these elevations could be really enormous, hundreds normal. This goes up to 10,000 in a perinatal form, a general uh, reflection of the severity of the disease. But it's interesting to us they, uh, these patients, except if they have B6 deficient uh, uh, seizures, B6 dependent seizures, um, don't have symptoms or signs of hypophosphatasia. There's no symptoms of toxicity, <clears throat> normal tissue levels of B6 metabolites, urinary, urinary levels of the degradation product are normal, and they respond normally to L-tryptophan. So, this told us that what's going on is that the accumulation of these natural substrates is actually occurring extracellularly. And lo and behold, that's where alkaline phosphatase is sitting on the surface of cells. So that PL, the form of B6 that gets into tissues, uh, is low only in the most severe forms of hypophosphatasia. The PL levels are what get into cells. If it's very low because of profound deficiency of TNSALP, keeping the PLP levels high, but this too low, then you don't synthesize gamma uh, butyric acid and seizures can be a consequence. 
So here's where the ethanolamine phosphate, phosphoethanolamine is. Alkphos is hooked to it, and then through a phosphatidyl inositol glycan linkage apparatus to the cell surface. There it is. But here's the culprit in hypophosphatasia. It's the accumulation extracellularly of inorganic pyrophosphate because it, as Professor Mian has told you, is a potent inhibitor of mineralization. So how can you treat this? Uh, back in the 1980s, we tried for that little girl on the pillow who would go on to die from hypophosphatasia, giving her enzyme replacement by intravenous infusions of alkaline phosphatase-rich plasma from patients with Paget bone disease, lots of alkaline phosphatase. <clears throat> so here she is at baseline, below the normal range, but if you infuse the Paget plasma uh, over a course of five days, she's in the normal range. You keep doing this for two months, and you think the x-rays are a little bit better, but she still has terrible uh, chest deformity and dies of staph pneumonia. Then you say, okay, we need more activity. Uh, you purify a human placenta, knowing that the placental isoenzyme has the same catalytic site you infuse. You get even higher levels into this little boy. Um, you sort of treat the circulation correctly, but he still goes on to die because the bones don't get better. And this is repeated a number of times in other children. Uh, it doesn't work. So you want to know, can we increase TNSALP or bone alkphos directly in bone? Uh, you got to go beyond fixing the circulation to getting the levels up near those matrix vesicles. And to do this, here we are in the, uh, what, 19, early 2000s, doing marrow cell transplantation for life-threatening infantile hypophosphatasia, some stromal cell uh, in, uh, infusions as well. And there was rescue. The x-rays did get better. Uh, the, the two uh, infant girls that we did this in survived. Uh, but subsequently, there was sort of severe childhood hypophosphatasia. Their blood levels of alkaline phosphatase didn't change, but maybe there was enough going on in their bone tissue per se to account for this radiographic improvement. In adults, uh, later, 2007, we started giving teriparatide, hoping that in an adult with one normal TNSA-ALP allele, the teriparatide would drive the alkaline phosphatase. Down came the vitamin B6. And in this patient, you see uh, this crack in the bone that over um, five months heals uh, with a little increase in serum alkaline phosphatase activity. So it seemed if you can get alkaline phosphatase into the skeleton in hypophosphatasia, it would help. And in 2005, Venobia Pharma in Montreal and then subsequently Alexian Pharma in Boston, they made a recombinant tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. The homodimer was there. It was hooked to an IgG1 FC fragment to prolong its circulating half-life and make it easy to purify. And then cleverly, it was hooked up to a DEXA aspartate, 10 aspartate uh, motif so that it would bind to hydroxyapatite crystals. And we tried with uh, Professor Mian and others Enzyme replacement therapy, knowing that Jose Luis had developed a beautiful murine model that recapitulated the infantile form of hypophosphatasia. And when they got this recombinant alkaline phosphatase, it worked very well. The mice stopped seizing. They stopped losing their teeth. Their bones got better, and they uh, lived uh, on um, essentially normally. So... Of course, you turn to the uh, babies uh, with life-threatening perinatal or infantile hypophosphatasia. And in 2012, we published in the New England Journal how nine of these patients benefited from enzyme replacement therapy for the perinatal or infantile life-threatening forms of hypophosphatasia. There was radiographic respiratory 
respiratory and functional improvements documented. That New England paper talked about the experience using this therapy given once IV and then subcutaneously three times a week out to one year with these kind of improvements. And the first patient who was flown from Northern Ireland to Cheryl Greenberg in Winnipeg was about to be intubated, but she started the therapy. And like other patients, look at the kind of x-ray change here, terrible uh, rickets at the provisional zone of calcification and metaphysis. After just three weeks, you could see that you're now seeing the end of the bones. And after 10 weeks, nice mineralization. So these infants uh, exhibited that on x-ray and they had those other improvements. Look at the horrible chest at baseline, thin ribs, you almost can't see them here. But at nine weeks, what's remarkable is mineral gets deposited everywhere at the growth plates in the ribs in the skull. And these nice plump wide ribs, once they mineralize will remodel and they'll look more normal uh, after maybe six or eight months or a year. First, you get the mineral in, then you could have remodeling, and uh, that's the result of the therapy. So that, that little girl on the penguin mask, at two years and one year of therapy, she's able to walk. Two years of treatment at three, can do that. Three years of treatment off to school. And at seven years of treatment, able to do this. She did need craniectomy and scoliosis surgery, but you would see that as opposed to historical controls, where maybe 27% were alive at uh, three years uh, without therapy, survival on aspartase alpha was greater than 90% in this patient population. So then uh, if you read Lancet Diabetes Endocrinology in 2019, we published the seven-year outcome for those nine patients as they went into a phase two extension trial. And you'll get the details about how they persisted to do well on enzyme replacement therapy so that treatment was well tolerated, uh, significant improvement in mineralization was at three months and sustained over seven years. Nearly all of these patients required some respiratory support, some even intubated at baseline or soon after, but uh, all were extubated, no longer needed respiratory support, and the survival was 90%. So with that accomplished, then you turn to the children, and those are the ones with severe childhood hypophosphatasia, where we're publishing in JCI Insight in 2016. Here with bigger kids, you can have additional objectives. Not only can you look at the radiographs, uh, but you can now measure uh, secondary and exploratory endpoints like physical performance. You could do bone biopsy, uh, look at uh, the pyrophosphate and the vitamin B6 levels in the blood, see how they're growing. And a scale was developed, two scales actually, that would at baseline have these kind of abnormalities rated, uh, known, and then blinded radiologists would compare, let's say at one year or here 4.5 years compared to baseline, and there would be a scale of no change if it got really bad, minus three, but if you had very good healing, plus three, complete or uh, near complete healing, and for that scale at 4.5 years, the RGIC is plus two, substantial healing, not perfect. But this was the kind of tool that was used to assess treatment. And here is the RGIC for the kids at each visit. So you got baseline over here, but then at three months of treatment, plus 1.8, uh, plus two by six months, and then if you went out to five years above substantial healing, uh, and that was true out to seven years. So that was one tool. But then there were physical assessments like uh, handheld dynamometry, how well you could jump and run. And at baseline, a patient with severe childhood would walk 350 meters like this, 
But after six months of therapy, 401 meters, much more normal gait. Little guy here at baseline couldn't walk. But after a year and a half of therapy, healing of the rickets could do that. And the six minute walk test, here's the normal range. It went from well below baseline into the normal range and then really stayed there out to uh, the length of the uh, study. Uh, you could do um, sort of uh, jumping, 14 inches at baseline. This little girl at uh, six months of therapy is much stronger and does that. And you could do a strength and agility composite score well below at baseline, but then by one year, uh, even six months in the normal range and persisting, with in the normal range for strength and agility on enzyme replacement therapy. This little guy was an exception. He's just learning to walk at three and a half years of age, but he becomes the best on his baseball team after two and a half years of uh, treatment. So certainly most of the kids in the normal range, he's an exception. And disability index by um, three years of uh, treatment, maybe even sooner, the disability index returns to really no disability at all in these uh, severe childhood hypophosphatasia patients. There were injection site reactions, red spots, and kind of nasty in some of the patients, lipohypertrophy, not atrophy, but blobs of fatty uh, tissue accumulation, normal fat that makes rotation of the injection sites very important. So safety, transient, uh, dose-dependent injection site reactions, no acetase alpha-related uh, serious adverse events, no ectopic calcification looking at the eyes or the kidneys, and there were low titer anti-acetase alpha, trade name Strenzik antibodies, but no evidence of clinical resistance. And then um, we turn to the adults and adolescents and here published in Bone back in 2019 was five-year efficacy and safety of using asphatase alpha, trade name Strenzik for adults and adolescents with hypophosphatasia, where they showed some um, further uh, six-minute uh, walking, and uh, a number of them changed from needing a wheelchair to walking, let's say with a walker or a walker, now using a cane or a cane no longer necessary uh, with evidence that the osteomalacia and bone biopsy showed uh, evidence of uh, healing. So asphatase alpha, Strenzik, was approved in Japan for patients of all ages with hypophosphatasia in July of 2015. And then very soon after, in Canada, Europe, and the United States, if there was pediatric onset, if you had classic adult onset, that's difficult. Um, uh, can you find evidence of pediatric onset? But if there's pediatric onset, uh, then yes, uh, in the United States and Europe, uh, asphatase alpha becomes uh, available. I close showing you this little one, that was the little girl with severe uh, childhood hypophosphatasia baseline. And then three months of therapy, nine months, look, mom, no hands. And then after one year of therapy on commercial products, she's able to do that. So time is up and uh, I'll thank you and uh, look forward to um, any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you very much. I'm not sure whether they, I'm, I've been listening to here. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you very, very much, both presenters. Thank you, Michael White. We have uh, time not for too many questions. Mm. So we're gonna do a couple of questions for each of you. Um, I'll start with uh, a couple of questions that came from the chat uh, for uh, Jose Luis Milan. I'm gonna change to Spanish, I'm sorry. Sure. Eh, um, tenemos tiempo para dos o tres preguntas para cada uno de los presentadores. Eh, voy a empezar con, eh, con José Luis. José Luis, eh, una, una pregunta que eh, me hacen aquí desde el chat es, um, a ver, uh, um, en, uh, perdón, no, 
¿Dónde estamos las preguntas? Veamos. Eh, ¿Cómo fue el proceso de identificación de la molécula de unión de la, alcalina, de la fosfatasa alcalina de manera de asegurar eh, que una vez se que se incorpora al organismo va al hueso? Ah, entre vos y Michael respondí un poquito eso, pero por ahí nos podés aclarar algo más. Gracias. Claro, el truco fue justamente... Eh, eh, combinar la fosfatasa alcalina con, con un, una secuencia de poliaspartatos, que es una secuencia que se encuentra nativamente en ciertas proteínas. La osteopontina la tiene, por ejemplo. Una secuencia de, de, de aspartica acid una atrás de la otra. Y, y eso confiere una, una afinidad por hidroxiapatita sintética. Así que el concepto era simple, utilizar una, una molécula que, que es, se encuentra en la biología naturalmente, combinarla con, con en, en, esta, en esta enzima recombinante para que al inyectar la, la, la enzima se dirija y se una a, 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 a lugares de mineralización eh, apropiados o inapropiados. Donde haya mineral, donde haya hidroxiapatita, ahí va a ir la enzima. Un, un, un principio muy elegante que en Obvia Pharma estaba, estaba desarrollando. Hay, otra, hay otras moléculas que hacen lo mismo, pero esta fue la que ellos se eligieron utilizar. Muy bien, gracias José Luis. Una segunda pregunta para vos. Me preguntan aquí eh, si en la práctica clínica eh, eh, sirve medir la, eh, los niveles de vitamina B6 en el caso de sospechar de hipofosateia o, o, o se mide el piridoxal 5-fosfato. Bueno, el piridoxal fosfato es el que va a estar más elevado. Es, es, un, es un analito, un analyte, una, una, una molécula que es mucho más sensible más fácil de medir también y mucho más sensible que el pirofosfato inorgánico, que es en realidad el causante de la enfermedad. Pero es mucho más fácil medir el piridoxal fosfato que, que el pirofosfato. No hay muchos kits comerciales y pocos laboratorios miden pirofosfato. Así que PLP es más fácil de medir en la clínica. Ok, muchas gracias. I want to change to Dr. Uh, to Dr. White um, for one question. Um, Uh, Dr. White, so thank you again for your presentation. Uh, here we have a question about treating hypophosphatasia with uh, vitamin, B, vitamin um, B6 uh, and how is it administered and what is the frequency in the case of mild cases of uh, health, um, hypophosphatasia? Uh, it's really vitamin B6 uh, supplementation um, Uh, pyridoxine hydrochloride that is appropriate for the very severe perinatal and infantile uh, hypophosphatasia patients uh, with the B6 dependent seizures. Uh, it will suppress the seizure activity for weeks or months, but the limited clinical experience is that the seizures will uh, return Uh, the treatment becomes refractory and then the bone disease becomes overwhelming. Um, and that is what requires treatment to have the patients continue to live. Um, what I see in the, and I made the point in my lecture, is that the uh, patients with Uh, let's say severe childhood, childhood, and more mild forms of hypophosphatasia clinically do not have the uh, canonical uh, symptoms uh, or signs or complications of B6 deficiency. Uh, to my thinking, the only uh, confirmed complication of disrupted B6 metabolism is the seizures in the uh, first year of life in those life-threatening cases. Uh, but there is uh, lots of emerging um, interest in the physiological role of uh, tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. It's substrates that were so uh, wonderfully uh, gone through by uh, Professor Mian uh, that uh, one wonders whether or not um, uh, The abnormalities that were defined in the very severely affected the knockout mice uh, carry on to the children and the adults. And it will be work for the future to know whether or not some of the abnormalities manifest in those mice uh, continue on and to what degree of, uh, let's say, clinical significance they have 
when you have more mild hypophosphatasia. So coming back to the vitamin B6 story, um, what I hope to publish uh, very soon is a 23 year uh, experience looking with Stephen Coburn, a, a vitamin B6 chemist, at not only the levels of PLP, which are really invariably elevated in the pediatric disease, but what about the levels of the business end of the molecule, PL and pyridoxic acid, which is a way of measuring vitamin B6 repletion? What we hope to report is that there's no deficiency of PL, again, the form of vitamin B6 that gets into the cells once you get away from the life-threatening forms of hypophosphatasia. The levels are not low, and therefore we see no reason to suspect compromise or complications from a disturbance of B6 metabolism in these more mild cases. When you look at adults and you measure PA and PL, it's interesting that some of these uh, adults resemble the general American population with some evidence of B6 insufficiency. And there we would say, take the recommended daily allowance, get your vitamin B6 levels, now measurable as PA, into the normal range, but don't take pharmacologic doses of vitamin B6, because if you make more PLP doing that, um, then you may actually be disturbing the hydrolysis of inorganic pyrophosphate and make your bones worse. So it looks like for adults, um, you can now measure biochemically PA, find that you're in the normal range, stay there, uh, but don't use pharmacologic dosing. You're not uh, you're going to help uh, hypophosphatasia and you can actually make the bony disease worse. Uh, maybe in a few months, we'll see that published in great detail, but uh, uh, that's where we're heading now. Okay, great. I have another question also from the chat, and I think this was maybe the last question if you, I know that we have many things that we could talk about, but this is uh, specifically about the treatment with the enzyme, the, the enzyme replacement treatment with the asph uh, asphotase alpha. And so the question is, um, uh, for how long um, the um, uh, asphotase alpha treatment is done in kids? And how is the evolution of the kids if that treatment stopped? And for how long you follow them up after that? Is, is that, that question is for me, I, I take it, yes? yes? Yes, please, Dr. White. Yes, I mean, the way um, we would see it is almost uh, lifelong therapy. Once you begin it for, let's say, severe hypophosphatasia, uh, there is some, um, I would say, uh, almost anecdotal evidence or clinical experience that the symptomatology of, let's say, severe or mild uh, childhood hypophosphatasia can diminish when you're a young adult. Uh, your growth plates fuse, so in that sense, the rickets um, goes away, and there may actually be a honeymoon uh, period for maybe a decade or more than that um, in young adult life. Uh, we don't know the great the, the likelihood of return or uh, presentation now with adult hypophosphatasia, but that's certainly uh, in the clinical experience that if you talk to adults who think who you think have adult onset disease, they'll tell you about or their mothers will tell you about their premature loss of teeth and maybe not being terribly athletic. So <clears throat> whether or not there's a honeymoon period when uh, the dose can be diminished or even stopped, and then the patient watched is uh, something for future clinical experience. But otherwise, um, uh, currently, we would uh, consider uh, the need that uh, the dose has to uh, be maintained. Uh, 
unpublished will aim to do this. Uh, we did have a, a young lady with severe childhood, actually survivor of the infantile form, who went on therapy, uh, had a very lovely clinical response, but then developed um, uh, lipohypertrophy. A teenage girl wanted uh, to wear a swimsuit and not have that uh, parent uh, underwent uh, uh, removal of the excess fatty tissue, but then uh, there was a return elected to stop the uh, the treatment and return to uh, needing to be in a wheelchair. So depending on the severity of the disease to begin with, uh, we certainly worry about clinical deterioration uh, if during childhood the, uh, the therapy is stopped. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Um, quisiera para concluir, uh, José Luis, um, ya que sos el, el argentino de los dos presentadores, que nos digas un poquito cuál, cuál fue tu experiencia, solamente un, un, unos segundos, de, de haber empezado a, a estudiar la fosfatasa alcalina en un tubo de ensayo y llegar hasta esta conclusión de poder tratar eh, pacientes en, en enzyme replacement, en, reemplazarla en, en, en humanos. Si nos sí, puedes contar qué es lo que sentís. Lo que ha sido muy interesante en mi carrera es que comencé como bioquímico clínico en Mar del Plata. O sea, siempre tenía la conexión con el paciente. Sin, sin ser médico, vi siempre la, la, la importancia de, de estar, re, relacionar todas las preguntas científicas que fueran interesantes, de qué manera pudiesen ayudar al paciente. Así que cuando tuve la oportunidad de, de formar un laboratorio y comenzar a hacer investigaciones eh, básicas, siempre es de tipo traslacional. O sea, ¿qué significa esto para el paciente? ¿Cómo puedo... Eh, ayudar a, en, en de alguna manera alguna enfermedad. Así que por eso siempre he tratado de ir de, la, de, la, de los estudios más básicos de una molécula de succión, de qué manera puedo ayudar a un paciente y cómo puede este mecanismo explicar la patología o, 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 o un síntoma que el paciente esté experimentando. Aún mismo ahora, cómo tratar de explicar la, la poca tolerancia al frío que tienen estos pacientes, que cualquier problema de cognición pueden tener con la falta de fosfatasa alcalina que no está siendo corregido con asfotasa, asfotasa alfa, qué pasaría con el hígado en estos pacientes que antes hubiesen fallecido, ahora van a tener una larga vida. O sea, estas son las preguntas que me siguen motivando a trabajar en el laboratorio. Muchísimas gracias. Y con esto concluyo esta sesión sobre hipofofatella y... Um, um, y, y les agradezco muchísimo que me hayan elegido para presentar estas dos eminencias y muchas gracias a todos. Fantástico esta, esta jornada de enfermedades raras. Con, gracias, a todos. gracias, Lucas. Gracias, Lorena. Gracias a todos. Muy amable. Hasta Buenas pronto. noches a todos. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.